Hey everybody, it's Paul Ramsey, and I'm uh, back with Dr. Manny St. Victor, and I'm a little thrown off because I just messed up the beginning of this recording, and I'm going to trim it, so we're going to start all over again. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you can blame it on the little hippo of campus that just got in your eye. That lingers for a bit. I know. Yeah. I know. All right, you ready? Here we go. Yeah, man. Hey everybody, I'm Paul Ramsey, back with the third episode. Thanks to Dr. Manny St. Victor, who knows about all of this brain stuff we're talking about this week. The different parts of the brain, we've covered the amygdala, we've covered the prefrontal cortex, and today we get to talk about the hippocampus. The which, campus of hippos. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> which I'm excited about, I'm excited about all of it, but... For me, again, to me, I, I tend to go to like what feels practical to me, and I'm so glad that we agreed to talk about this part of the brain because um, we're talking about memories, right? Yeah, I was gonna say, do you get nostalgic when you talk about the hippocampus? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, who, who sings that? Memories all alone in the moonlight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That song? I'm still trying to get you to sing something, but you know. <laughs> Yeah. That's what okay. not, as, not as long as I'm just drinking tea. If I was drinking something else, we might get there, but not just tea. Right, we might get some bar tales going. So, so let me have it. Like, it, yeah, it's literally, it's solely responsible for the formation of memory? Um, and navigation through space. There's place cells in there, so there's some space navigation. No way. Uh, yeah, because if you think back, a lot of memory is associated with place. You know, they have the state state concepts where um, if you learn, study for a test in a particular place and location, place in, in a state of mind, when you are in that state of mind, your, your body will retrieve those memories better. And really, that's a large part of the cueing, but your, your memories are cued sort of by emotional context. So if you're angry at someone, it's a lot easier to remember all the other anger-related memories. And you can imagine why that's, why that's adaptive, because yeah, if you're in, you're, the purpose of memory is for you to stay alive, okay? It's right. for you to recognize something, retrieve the context that it relates to from before, and make a decision. Like, your hippocampus is what allowed for episodic memory, which means, like, events, event change. Uh, another kind of larger chain of that is autobiographical memories, memories about yourself. They're all stored in your hippocampus. Um, what is important to know about the hippocampus? Now, in order for stuff to get integrated and encoded correctly in your hippocampus most effectively, you need to be paying attention. Yeah, without attention, if you're dissociated or if you're stressed where you're not attending, the memories other parts of the memory, like the physical aspects, might get encoded, but a nice, well-remembered, integrated memory won't happen that way. Now, I bring that up because when you have trauma-type situations and you scare the crap out of someone, the amygdala seizes up, and so uh, the amygdala makes it that your memory is not encoded well in the hippocampus. Uh, you get this cortisoid, uh, glucocorticoid cascades, what they call it, like cortisol just stress hormones it, that cuts off the relationship between your prefrontal lobe and your hippocampus. But the amygdala is more than happy to swap it. So you end up without, without the frontal component of the behavior. And if you remember last time we talked about your prefrontal cortex with self-control, um, empathy, just all your higher order functioning, your uh, decision making, your goal-directed behavior. So you end up just this lizard brain style, fear, anger, rage, you know, just stuff that does that unfiltered emotions. Let's let me we'll, we'll refresh for people. We did this before when we talked about the the amygdala. We used this very same graphic. So what you folks see is um, the parts uh, in red are the amygdala, which we talked about uh, in an earlier episode, and then the blue is the hippocampus. But not all of what's in blue, right? If I from other diagrams I've seen, where it runs from the red and curves up and around, or is that whole thing? Is that all hippocampus? I think those are horns. Yeah, those are the horns. Amon's horns. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's broken down into two parts, but um, we don't need to worry about that for now. <laughs> okay. 
So, um, again, so we, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about the amygdala, the idea that these red uh, parts, which are the amygdala, directly connected to the blue, which and it, it's only for the purpose of this graphic, just so people don't, I don't want to have people thinking that they have a blue and a red thing in their head. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the the part highlighted in blue is the hippocampus. So the part that is uh, responsible for fear directly connected to the part that's responsible for the formation of memory. Yeah. And and so then you were talking, Manny, about um, how when fear gets kind of too big, we lose that efficient connection to the prefrontal cortex, yeah. which helps us keep self control. Um, yeah, your amygdala just starts seizing up. And what's important to keep in mind is that although these things are connected in that in that diagram, what you're really looking at is electrochemical like waves. And the way it really ends up looking is when two brain parts are communicating, they vibrate at the same frequency. Okay? It's and I think of it as the best way to imagine it is if I turn my TV well, I did the like 1990s turn, like where I just did a knob. <laughs> That's depressing that I did that in public. Um, but when you tune, say, your radio, let's use the old school radio. When you tune to 99.5, your radio is resonating at a particular um, signal velocity, like frequency, and the tower over at the station is resonating at a velocity, and now you have coming through your radio that signal, right? Yeah. Or did I go to, to like... Um, Techno geek. No, but you got when you switch to another station, you're going to be tuning into another signal. Now, if you imagine that different towers, different brain parts are resonating at different frequencies to communicate, that's sort of how you sync them up. You know, parts that are wired together fire together. It's not as much a bridge, it's not wiring as much as synchrony, resonance. Okay. That's kind of it makes it easier to realize how a part way in the back can talk to a part in the front which can talk to your fingertips. You know, you just, mm, that's, consciousness is when higher level parts are resonating together. Okay. In, in, in one sync. That may have been too much data, but I get caught no, up. Oh, no, no, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. So hippocampal uh, is, the key things to remember is uh, episodic memory and, um, to play cells, which is like navigation, three-dimensional navigation. Now, so space-time navigation is a good way to think of it. So, Do you know, um, this is just pure curiosity. If you don't know this, it's fine. Why is there so much more sort of real estate in that picture that I used? Like, why is there so much blue than red, for example? Like, Because I think it's just amygdala just happens to be that size. There yeah. might be some some historical, not historical, but some developmental reason along the way. But yeah, I think to be that small, the amygdala can swap the whole hippocampus, though. That's kind of what I was first thinking about. I was yeah. thinking, here's these two little parts on this connected to this bigger, you know, s structure in the brain, and um, fear is so powerful, you know, yeah. and the idea that those two little almond-shaped things can really mess you up when they're firing hard. Yeah, and you do get amygdala hypertrophy in some cases where people have the anxiety disorders and, and like, fear syndromes. You get amygdala hypertrophy. So I would imagine a bigger amygdala would just be maladaptive in that you would just be signaling a lot more fear. Yeah. <laughs> now, um... <laughs> Again, this is always what happens. I'm tempted to go forward. We're going to talk in um, later episodes about sort of the processes. But, uh, without going too deep into it, it's like a, I want to say it, it works in the other direction, right? I mean, if I recall a memory which is fearful, it's just a memory. But by revivifying that memory... I fire down to the amygdala. Yeah, you and, trigger your own amygdala, yeah. Right? And the amygdala yeah. is firing off as if I'm in a fearful situation now, yeah. even though I'm not. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, to go from the other direction, if you're able to do cognitive reappraisal, which is look at the situation, take a breath, and before your amygdala goes firing, Think of some other possible scenarios in which it could happen, which are less catastrophic. You can de-escalate and 
stop the whole epigenetic cascade that would be fight flight. Okay. And that's like the most the most mature and most adaptive coping mechanism is to be able to with your frontal lobe not suppress the anger, be like I'm still angry or whatever, but to think to go back through the thought process of, well, maybe that's not what that person meant, or maybe I'm looking at the situation the wrong way, while your amygdala is firing off and you're ready to rip someone's eyeballs out. That's right. So now, hopefully, thing. folks, you see what Manny and I are trying to do is we've, we've talked about the amygdala in the first episode, and then we talked about the prefrontal cortex, which does this self-control and, and, and cognitive reappraisal stuff, and then we talk about hippocampus and memory, and we're starting to get toward how they connect and work together yeah. And we have more to do because we yeah. have two more episodes where we're going to talk about two other parts of the brain. Yeah. And, and then we're going to go on from there to um, modulators, the chemical and electrical processes that, that sort of make all this stuff fire off. And then we're going to go to the, the processes network. themselves. So yeah, we're, the networks and circuitry. Yeah, we're working our way down that path. So um, hang with us. Uh, you know, we've got a lot more to talk about. Do you have anything, Manny, that 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 like I didn't give you a chance to cover about the hippocampus that needs to be included? Not that I can think of right off. I mean, because I could go on for days about right, that. I know. Hippocampus. I know. You know? I mean, we're there's at like that basic level right now. We're at that yeah. basic level, so yeah. Lead us not to temptation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, that's that's today's episode focusing yeah. on the hippocampus, and we're gonna again. The goal of this is to keep helping you guys kind of grow with us because I'm right there with most of you you know Manny's the doctor the neuro, the cognitive neuroscientist I'm, I'm the hypnotist I help people but I don't help people with this kind of knowledge so I'm trying to represent you guys um, we're gonna keep at it we're gonna keep talking about this stuff our next yeah. episode we're gonna talk about the insula which yes. I literally never heard about until Manny told me that he thought it was worth oh, talking man, that's the most important thing. Well, wow. every part is the most important thing because you would miss them if they were gone. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, I've seen that. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, yeah. And so, like, that's what lets you know what's going on inside. And that's so important because, guess what? You blame it on everyone else. <laughs> you know, your insula does that integration and kind of controls – it's – some people go so far as to say it's consciousness. It's the seat okay. of consciousness. All right, we'll get there. That's it. Yeah. Don't go. Don't don't give it away. No spoilers. We'll uh, we'll get there in the next episode. So come check it out. Um, and if you missed the earlier episodes about the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, check those out at hypnoticthoughts.com. Uh, circle up Dr. Manny Saint Victor at Google Plus. Follow as Manny Cyanide. <laughs> and as man, that's right. I was thank you for reminding me. So it's. Manny Cyanide is his... S-C-I-E-N-I-D-E, uh, -E, like science. And you can, if you're more of a Twitter person, you can follow Mindful360 at Twitter, right? Yep. Right? And yep. Uh, I'm Paul Ramsey, and I'm at uh, Google+, and I'm at Twitter as well. So uh, check us out, follow us, and uh, feel free to send questions our way. That's yep. it for this episode. Thanks so much, Manny. Thanks, Paul. Always a pleasure, man. All right, we'll see you soon. Take care.